All right, well, hello everybody, and welcome to this Grow Native webinar, 10 easy to grow spring edible native plants for your garden with Dr. Nadia Navarrete Tendel. The Grow Native program is a native plant marketing and education program that serves the lower Midwest run by the Missouri Prairie Foundation. My name is Brooke Widmar. I'm the Director of Administrative Operations and Member Engagement for the Foundation. I do wanna take a, a moment to thank um, all of you for joining us, but also recognize and thank our Grow Native sponsors listed on the screen. Their support makes educational opportunities uh, like this one possible. So make sure and check out our lineup of master classes and free webinars currently scheduled through the end of April. Uh, during this presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. At the end, Carol will come on to read those out. Um, the webinar is being recorded. The link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with any resources mentioned in today's presentation. Um, so to introduce today's speaker, Nadia owns the consulting business Native Plants and More, and she also works full-time with Lincoln University. She's the specialty crops and native plant specialist uh, for the university based in Jefferson City. Uh, in her past work at Lincoln University, um, and currently she's created the Lincoln University Native Plants Program, the purpose of which is to increase awareness about the importance of native plants and conservation and as specialty crops through outreach and education. Uh, she's obtained funding from the National Institute of Food and Agriculture for the collaborative effort to create the Lincoln University Community Garden, Farmer's Market, and Commercial Kitchen, and the Finca Project, Families Integrating Nature, Conservation, and Agriculture. And in 2008, she received Missouri's highest conservation honor as she was inducted into the Conservation Hall of Fame as a master conservationist. So without further ado, take it away, Nadia. Thank you, Brooke. It's and hello everyone, thank you for joining us. And we're gonna keep it very uh, focused today as I decided to talk to you about them easy to grow in spring native edibles, but this doesn't mean that we have a myriad of plants that we can eat. Uh, I'm currently at Lincoln University and you can reach me uh, uh, at my uh, you can send an email to me if you have any questions at the end, we'll have it uh, for you. The outline on the press of the presentation is native plants versus introduced, just briefly we'll discuss that, what uh, foraging versus growing the natives. And also we thought we'll uh, mainly discuss about the thing native edible plants is to grow. And at the end, I just will add some known natives worth trying in some uh, bibliography. As a disclaimer, I want to be sure that you know your plants before you eat them. I'm sure many of you already have tried several. And just to let you know, the stem plants that I'm gonna discuss with you today, including the, in, in addition to the introduced ones, I already tried them. They have already been uh, tested in recipes. And we have to be aware that as with any foods, there is a potential for allergic reactions when consuming native edibles. A native plant versus an introduced plant. And many of you would know that are the plants had occurred naturally in a particular region, ecosystem or habitat without human introduction. And on the other hand, introduced ones were plants that were found in this country after European settlement. Gathering versus growing them. Native edibles uh, can be gathered, uh, usually from private land, but be sure you ask permission with landowners. And if you wanna gather from public lands, there are different rules that apply at different locations and for different plants. Be sure you learn about them before doing any gathering. 
and why not try to grow your own? So let's get started. I was just wanna show you at the beginning this nice picture that we had of a dining wild event at Lincoln University about three years ago. And where we serve uh, recipes prepared at least with one native edible. And many of the plants that I'm gonna discuss were served at these dinners. The very first one is why leeks or rams is a plant that grows in, across Missouri, scatter. So we are still learning what it naturally grows. It's a woodland plant and the leaves can be gathered in early spring. Here we see a picture in our own backyard with wild violets. Wild leaf blooms in summer, in late July. Flowers are pollinated by native bees. They're really beautiful. And they stand out because uh, the leaves are all gone. You know, you see is these beautiful flowers and they are pollinated by bees. They, uh, wild leeks propag are propagated from seeds and also bulbs and the seed matures in late September. It takes about a plant uh, to mature from seed. It takes about a, a plant growing from seed. It takes about seven years. So it takes long. But if you think about fruit tree, it also takes time to produce. So this is a precious plant that I think everybody should try. But if you don't wanna wait those seven years, why not buy them at, at your local native plant nursery? Here are some uh, seedlings that we grew. They require 18 months uh, to germinate because they're, they're special. There's, they have a special requirement of warm cold and warm stratification. For production, if you wanna, if you're interested in growing them in a, as, in a farm, both are available in large quantities. They, and we actually got, uh, got some for Lincoln University to do a, a study. And here we have some of the plants growing in a raised bed. So if you have a, a very shady spot where you don't know what to grow yet, I mean, you can grow your white flowers, your spring white flowers, but if you want to get something to eat, you can start with a raised bed like this. This, is, uh, this photo is at Lincoln University and we grew them from local sources. This is a natural site in Colombia, Missouri where you can see wild leeks growing together with sweet williams and uh, nettles, wood nettles, as, as in jewelweed. It's a pretty sight. And um, wild leeks can be, you can use a whole plant. And in our case, because we had events, we actually bought from uh, online some of these uh, wild leeks that were not available yet. Uh, locally, but now we know that there are farmers in Missouri that are growing there. They can go from 10 to 17 pounds, depending on the quality. And this is a beautiful recipe that Sam Pfeiffer from Colombia prepared for us, a focaccia bread with wild leek bulbs. This is uh, another recipe, just an idea for you if you um, prefer to keep your plants, let's say that you have some your leeks growing in your yard, you can just gather the leaves and you don't and then you can keep your whole plant. It's very tasty. The second plant I want to mention is golden glow or Sosham. This is a very special plant and it grows in also in woodland areas and is very um, it, blooms in late uh, in the fall. So the golden glow name is because it really glows in the dark or in the shade of trees, the flowers. The leaves are the part that you should eat in early spring and also in the fall. This is how the plant looks right now. They started to, to grow even in late winter when we, we had had some, so many warm days, so the plants are really starting to grow. And, but they can also go, grow, go through early spring. And this is how they're gonna look 
maybe in two, three weeks from now, this is the perfect time to gather. They are lookalikes, so to be sure that you learn the plan from an expert. Leaves can be gathered and you can also, you can blanch them and use them in recipes for calling for spinach or other greens. But you can also use these, these plants for, um, you can start the plant by dehydrating the leaves. And this is what I have here. And I, I don't know if you can see what I have with me, but I always have uh, containers with dry native edibles. We have them, it's what we use for spices at home, as well as other things. Golden Glow is very special and it's very easy to grow. Uh, this is, I just want to share this. It's just, it's just, it's just a, a link and we work with, with communities and this is in Jefferson City. Um, Patsy, Patsy Johnson, a community leader, prepared a kitchen for us. So that was special because it was their day. It was the first time for everyone in the, in the workshop that had a Golden Globe for the first time. These and other plants were established, you can see here on the right picture, uh, were established with funds with the, an NPF garden grant. And we have other edibles. And this is um, just to show you in more detail, this is Blanche leaves of Golden Glow. With, uh, these are the, the, the ingredients I use with white leaks. That was my egg casserole, simple and easy to do. A casserole frittata is probably the same ingredients, only different forms. The next plant is, is cut plant. This probably might be very, uh, it's a well-known plant. It can be a little aggressive and probably that makes it a, a good candidate for, for um, a specialty crop because they, they really can grow. But uh, so you can gather you, from seed. You can gather the leaves in the spring, most uh, for a short period. So in order to keep your bounty, I recommend to do the blanching, and also you can freeze them as well as uh, dehydrate them, and then you can add them in in your stews or soups. It is a perennial like the previous ones, and uh, as you can see. We had a monarch butterfly here and many other insects uh, love the flowers in the fall, some summer and in early fall. This is the, the basal leaves of the cup plant that you can gather. Again, the leaves are edible. You need to cook them slightly before you eat them. They are okay eating raw, and, but I prefer just a slightly cook. <clears throat> They're only harvest in the spring, as I mentioned before. These are the leaves, and then uh, you can use them once blanched. You can use them in soups, appetizers, and even my husband has tried them in kimchi. He made a good kimchi. Next plants. Actually, these are two, but I put them, I group them in one wood nettle and stinging nettle. Both would sting you. So you have to be careful when you harvest. But one really interesting thing about this plant besides being so nutritious and available for us to eat is that there are host plants for the comma, question mark, and red admiral butterflies. Wood nettle is actually has round, much more round leaves and they are alternate. They are both shade tolerant, so they might grow together, these two nettles. This is considered a native. And here is wood nettle with white leaks again in a natural stem. Already the, the leaks are dying off. This is later in the spring. Stinging nettle or Utica dioica is actually considered by some to be native and by some not to be native. So, and the reason for that is that there are two, two subspecies. And bad wool, since they are so nutritious, 
I, I would recommend that even before you learn it, if it's native or not native, you should eat it. They are really tasty. May, this plant here is probably a little too tall. In this case, you would only gather the leaves. And of course, you need to use gloves. And also, you need to blanch them. These ones actually do not require much cooking. One minute, some recommend, but I would say a little longer if you are not too, uh, if you want to be more cautious, maybe no more than five minutes. And here is how they look right now. I took this picture just yesterday from our backyard. And the way we keep them, they do spread. They do like to grow everywhere. But we have them in an area that is contained by a raised bed. And by harvesting constantly, you, that would be a good way to control. And here's what we do in this event that I mentioned at the beginning. We had this, this soup prepared with nettles and wild, and wild leeks. That was a real hit with participants. Now, the next group is native onions. Again, I group this in. These are two native onions that I like to talk more about. These are pictures of Allium canadense or glade onion. We also have metal, lar metal lar garlic. This is a, um, this onion is found in dry uh, woodlands and glades and also um, blooms early in the year, in the spring. The bulbs and flowers are edible and provides forage for bees and beetles and wasps. So it's an important plant. And meadow garlic, this is how it's looking. So you can recognize the seedlings, how they are. Sometimes it's very hard to separate onions, even uh, non-native onions from the natives. The, we have these ones growing in raised beds again in our backyard. We have a lot of shade, so, and these ones are uh, tolerant to, to shade. Now we have, um, this, is, this is the same, these are the same plants that will be later in the year, this is how they are gonna look. So if they look pretty similar, like in the glade, and they like to spread. The folk glade or prairie onion, as the names, the different common names suggest, is a plant that blooms in the fall. It can be found in glades or prairies. And also, um, they do like sun, fall sun, but I have seen them growing in, in moderate shade in the company of other plants. So I'm, I would call them like like fireworks when I see them because they're so beautiful, especially if you have a grouping growing. And all of these so far are perennials. They are definitely a good source for uh, beetles. Uh, for, they are foraged by beetles, bees, and other insects. And here's a little tiny sweat bee feeding on the flower. Cladonium. And here is how it's looking. I took a picture at Lincoln. We have a, a raised bed also with, um, where we have asparagus and, and glade onion and they grow together perfectly. And we have the tani and other, I mean, uh, chickweed and other little uh, non-natives, but we can also harvest. These are perfect plants to grow in pots if you don't have enough room for them. Then um, they grow well in raised beds. And here is a, a, a prairie tea as a companion. If you see here, these are the flowers coming. They're still not blooming, but it, it was very pretty. We rather use the flowers when we have plenty, of course, like this was, there was, a, this was a salad serve at one of the dining wilds. And the, on the right is a, is a cup plant appetizer with glade onion flowers. Let plant might not be, a, maybe it's not one that people have tried so much, but we did learn that the leaves are, can be used for tea. They're so beautiful, they are good for pollinators, and you can still use it for your teas without um, depriving the bees from feeding on the flowers. 
what you do is that in our case, this is a, a site that is a native plant outdoor lab that we have at Lincoln. So what we do is we prune some of the areas and then and we, so we can use it. We keep using the leaves for tea. We also dry them for later use. And here is a, one of the, the three, in one of the events, we had three different native teas. The, from left plant, mint, and sumac teas. It's really amazing, it's amazingly tasty. The left plant and mint, of course, and sumac. Another one that you might have not tried before is the spider words. We have Ohio spider word and we have a <clears throat> woodland spider word. Both they provide leaves and flowers that are edible. You can eat them raw. And I tried them for the first time last year. You just have to use your favorite um, salad dressing. And they, and if you add some of the flowers in your backyard, could be red baths or violets. It's really a tasty salad. This one actually has chickweed as well as hemp leaves. And here's how you can, is, is the, the, how the plant will look like when you can got, uh, harvest the leaves. And later today, the leaves are so uh, tender, it's smooth that they, they, don't, they never get hard, like nettles. <clears throat> Ostrich fern is, is another one that I think it should be planted more for food. We had a, a couple sites on at Lincoln and they really reproduce well. If they like the place, like this is a little uh, area in the north side in between buildings and it's just perfect because it's beautiful in the later in the spring, in summer and even through the, through the end of the year. But uh, you can harvest, you can use the leaves only at the beginning of the year. I don't have pictures of the recipes that we prepare, but what you do is that you gather the uh, unfolded leaves or fronds, and they can be raw, slightly cooked, and saute or roast, roasted, and add to salads or stir fries and frittatas. And uh, my next group is violets. I think many of you, many of you might have tried the, the flowers. They're so beautiful and they're sweet and it just, it just, they're just beautiful in salads. The leaves are also edible. You have to be a little careful if you have never eaten them because they might ca cause some problems with your stomach if you eat too many. But if you just add some here and there in the salad, they should be okay. This is a, a Viola striata. It's, a, it's white violet. And we actually have it in our yard instead of lawn in one part of the yard. It's pretty uh, shady and, and moist and grows as well uh, together with Sweet Williams. <clears throat> We uh, also use them for salads and stir fries, the leaves. And here is how they expand. Uh, they uh, expand in our yard. It just, for at least four, four months, we have flowers. They seem to last, maybe three, but they seem to, have, to last a while because they like to be together with other wildflowers. And we're always having a, a using the flowers. And as in my first slide, I had that they are a host plant for fritillary butterflies. And I think this is my last group of natives that I'm gonna talk about, native mints, hairy mountain mint. We use it, I mean, it's wonderful for pollinators, for bees, for any pollinator. And we use the leaves in the early, in the spring and through the summer. And, and also we prune them if we have plenty. And so we can have new growth and we use them for tea and for desserts. 
slender mounted mint is also, uh, we have used these leaves, but we have found out that they are not always have that strong smell like hairy mountain mint. Hairy mountain mint is, is the best. <clears throat> and this is one dessert that we tried one year that you can see it, it was just amazing. Mountain mint chocolate chip cheesecake. I hope that in the future we can do again this dining wild events. And some of you probably had uh, participated in them, it, they're really fun. And within the mints, I group them together. I group them as, a, as native mints. Uh, the last one is Dittany. It, this is a very small plant with a very, very, uh, that is very aromatic as the scientific name suggests. Is uh, you can place it for oregano. It grows in open woodlands or savannas, but you know, so we have it growing in our front yard under the shade of a sweet gum, but also is open in the part of the part of the day. It has maybe um, like four hours of sun. And um, they are perennials also, and they bloom in the fall. You can use the leaves or the flowers. Uh, both are edible, and you can start gathering the leaves early, like in uh, late spring. So we use them as a spice, and, and they, we gather them all year. And I was, I think I have, this is what I do with, this is actually nettles, but this is what I do. I dry them and I keep them in little containers like this, like any spice. And we, we have prepared crackers and shortbread. They have been flavored with litany. And these will go perfect with chicken, also flavored with litany. And this is the last slide I have for native edibles. And we're going to move on to some of the uh, introduced edibles that I think they're worth trying. Like this one here, you can see hembit. And we, this picture was taken in the, in the teaching greenhouse uh, on campus where we let them grow together. We just gather both and they go in salads together. And of these, uh, of the non-natives, I think purslane is my favorite. It grows, in, it's an annual. Uh, it can be really, really a nuisance if, in your yard if you don't want it. And, but the whole plant is edible. And what we do, we, we prune it and then we keep, uh, we keep gathering uh, the new growths. They can be eaten raw or slightly cooked, but they are very highly nutritious. And here's Patsy again, helping us gathering first lane. Hembit and dead nettle is the next one. Uh, uh, I put them uh, together because usually people get confused with them. They look kind of like but if you see them uh, closely, they are a little different. And they can also be used in any, uh, in any recipe that calls for greens. And I was reluctant to try them because I see them growing everywhere. But they are, they are really tasty once you, when, it depends on your recipe, of course. You can collect the leaves in the springs and <clears throat> eat both leaves and flowers. And uh, lamb's water is my last one. I had to put it here because I hope people already are eating them. They are so ubiquitous. They are in every garden that has good soil and they are really tasty. You can find your favorite recipe with them and replace for spinach uh, or kale. It's very tasty in soups. And with that, uh, I just wanna uh, show what uh, I just have talking about some of the native greens that you can eat. There are so many, but uh, at Lincoln we have this beautiful area that we call Finca, a uh, Finca, Finca Eco Farm. Uh, Finca is the acronym for Families Integrating Nature Conservation and Agriculture. It's a, a one of the grants that I got uh, a few years back. 
but finca in Spanish is also the name. It's, it just means farm. And I would say more small farms is how it is in my uh, country, El Salvador. And so here in this, uh, in Finca, we not only have native greens, we have fruits, we have tubers, plants, and specialty crops. And with the last uh, slide I wanna show you is um, we have the, the biblio, a bibliography, um, a bibliography of what I have. This is in my own shelves. This is only a few of the, of the books that I use. There are so many more. I would say, uh, well, we'll talk about it if maybe somebody has a question about the books, but none are really, none is comprehensive. You need to have several. And with that, I thank you for your time. Next time, we'll talk more about desserts when we talk about fruits. Hopefully we can see, I uh, will see you again or will you see me again? And for more information, please uh, contact me at navarreteteam.n, lincolnu.edu, or on my Facebook page, Native Plants and More, is where uh, you can find me and you can communicate with me. And with that, I probably would have a few questions to answer. Mm -hmm. So Carol, I'm ready for you. Yes, thank you so much, Nadia. This is Carol David. I'm the executive director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation for Native Program. And thank you, Nadia, that was wonderful. And it's right before dinner time, or well, cl getting close to dinner time. So um, your uh, uh, photos were extra appetizing and I can personally vouch for how wonderful the Dining Wild uh, program is. And I, I sure hope that that can resume and I encourage everybody to participate. Um, there are a number of questions and um, uh, there were a number of questions, people asking about the taste of these plants. I know you, you mentioned that the violets were sweet, but could you um, and talk a bit about, I think it was like a cup plant and golden glow um, and some of the others, can you describe the taste? The taste is, is, is not like a spinach, I have to tell you, in, in as far as, it's very hard to explain because it just they have their unique flavor. And usually uh, with the greens, uh, again, between the cup plant and, and golden glow, I prefer to eat golden glow by itself. I just put a little bit of lemon and salt and that's my dinner, it's part of my dinner. But it just really, um, it's not astringent, it's not, it just uh, maybe, I would say live flavor is not really something that um, doesn't, they don't, they're not aromatic. So they don't have a strong smell either. So I just uh, encourage you to try it on your own because it's very hard to explain. <laughs> uh, we have, dif I'm sure that we all have different tastes. Thank you. And of course that um, Golden Glow is in the Rudbeckia genus of plants. And Deborah is asking, are there other Rudbeckia species that are edible? As far as I know, it's the only one we know. Uh, the other ones seem to, they, I mean, all the other Rudbeckias I know, they have harsh leaves and they seem to be, um, they, they're never soft in, this, in, the, in the spring. And this plant, because it grows in the shade, also, you can, if they're growing deep shade, they actually, the leaves even tastier because they, they, they are supposed to sun, they might get a little uh, stringy. So no, as far as I know, I don't know any, any other. Thank you. Um, Jill asks, you said Golden Glow has lookalikes. Are those lookalikes potentially poisonous? There is, yeah, there is one that it might be, no, no, actually there is one plant that I, um, um, no, they're not poisonous. I cannot think about the name of the plant that I've seen that I really, I really thought it was a golden glow before I was, I knew, knew it well, but is there are no poisonous lookalikes. Thank you. How much of your growing onions can you safely harvest without weakening your plants? 
and as I mentioned that I, with the glade onion, the glade onion, Carol? Um, she said growing onion, but maybe she meant glade onion. And, well, the, the onions. We prefer to use the flowers instead of the tubers. If we, the only way that we harvest tubers is when they are really abundant and we grow them in raised beds. So uh, we are not talking about a garden that we put these plants here and there. It's more like a, on purpose. We're growing them on purpose to um, as crops. Then they reproduce uh, readily uh, from, uh, they actually form bulbs around the mother bulb. So you usually don't deplete uh, your plants if you gather some bulbs, but you have to wait until your stand is well established. That's for sure. But if people are concerned about cutting, uh, killing the plants, just use your flowers just for a subtle flavor in your salad. Thank you. Um, Russ has a helpful comment. He says, I've heard some people mistaking buttercup leaves for golden glow leaves. Buttercup leaves are somewhat poisonous, but they taste bad, so I doubt people would eat a lot of them. So just a, a bit of information there. Um, okay. A couple questions on a source for finding um, the, the wild leeks, uh, seeds or, or bulbs to, to plant. Yeah, in Missouri, we have uh, some native uh, plant producers that sell uh, wild leeks. And I would suggest to go in the grow native um, a, a source book. And I don't know if I should say, well, I, I know who sells them. May I say the Yeah, uh, nursery? yeah I think that, yes, that's fine. Uh, Missouri Wildflowers Nursery, I know they are, they have been selling for the past few years. And I know that um, there is another, um, um, let's see, Millipon, Millipon Farm, they do sell uh, wild leeks through the Native Plant Society. This is here in central Missouri, but in across Missouri, I'm not aware of. In the case of uh, when we, we were using the bowls, when I show you the focaccia bread, we have to order online because we don't have enough uh, white leeks available commercially. People go to public lands, and it's what I was, I want to uh, mention that, that people should be aware or should be very, um, de uh, detain themselves from gathering from public land. If you do that, just gather the leaves, but not the whole plant. But it's why we are trying to promote native plants as a, a wild leeks as crops here at, at Lincoln. And, and I think it, it, it works, it's just that you have to be patient. Thank you, yeah, it's wonderful to, to grow our own. Um, and that certainly safe, safeguards wild populations. Um, yeah. Question, uh, have you ever made pesto with the various greens like cup plant? Yes, I have. <laughs> yeah, we have tried so many different things and then, and I have made, uh, I have mixed all these leaves together with wild leeks and just to die for. It's just wild leaves give them the uh, wonderful flavor. So yes, and you can do that with any of these greens that I talk about. Great. Um, Question about, um, oh, do you eat the flowers of cut plant and golden glow? I don't. They, are, they doesn't mean that they are not edible. I just haven't tried them. What we have, we did one year is that we use the petals just to add into salad. So that would be just a, like garnish, but it's a little hard to, if you have plenty of cup plants, of course you can use the plant, the, the whole flowers, but I would suggest just to use the petals. Everything else would be kind of harsh to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, question about dandelions. Of course, they're non-native, but uh, they occur in our lawns and lots of other places. Can you talk about um, eating dandelion plants? Yeah, I would encourage people to do it. Right now is, a, is the right time. Uh, like. There's so many native plants and so many edibles in your lawns that you don't know about, well, at least I didn't know for so many years. And I finally tried dandelion and this time right now, 
they are just perfect, they compare to arugula. And I know there are many people that are so into eating them for any purpose. So, so yes, I encourage people to eat dandelion and the flowers too. And of course you use the flowers to make fritters, but that um, I rather use them fresh. Yes, they, they, people should be eating them. And, and Nadia, you say now is a good time because the leaves, they're more tender. Is that what you mean? Yes, because it, before they, they, by maybe another two weeks or um, uh, during the, after these strains, it would be perfect. They would be tender and they don't, and later on they get a little um, kind of like, a, they have some spines in the leaves and also, but very tiny. And also they get very, very bitter. That would be something that people like in the, their salads, like arugula. In, but I do prefer them this time of the year or when the plant is, is young. Thank you. Um, there's a comment. Um, uh, my understanding is that ostrich fern cannot be safely eaten raw because raw or undercooked ostrich fern fiddleheads contain thiaminase, which is an enzyme that breaks down vitamin B1 in your body. So that's something to be aware of. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, so let's not eat it until um, I would recommend to eat it cook after that comment. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry, oh, a question. Do, when do you blanch and freeze? Do you oil it first? And I think you mentioned about, about blanching and freezing at least one of the plants. Do you yes. put oil on it first? Actually, all of the all of them can be like even uh, like uh, leaves. You don't need to blanch, but a uh, golden glow, cut plant, and uh, nettles they can be blanched and just like that put them in the freezer. You don't need to add anything if you want to make your own pesto in advance. That's and then you can freeze your pesto, but uh, otherwise they really um, store very well. Just freezing them after blanching. And one, another way to, to I mentioned about dehydrating uh, all these plants, they all do, uh, they can be dehydrated in a regular dehydrator and then keep it, keep, and then I uh, grind them with a coffee grinder and then you can have it for, uh, uh, ready to go. It's a way to store them too. Thank you. Nancy asks, how deer or rabbit resistant are these uh, plants that you've mentioned? I've never seen rabbits. I don't think, but the, these plants, most of these plants are so easily grown. Onions, definitely. Rabbits don't like them. And cut plants don't seem, uh, ra we have rabbits in our, in our yard. They, maybe they munch a little, but they don't like too much. Or maybe when they, they're very, very tender leaves. Golden glow, on the other hand, could be, no for rabbits, but deer is actually, it has another name also, cows partially. So that would suggest that cows love them. And we were actually trying to grow some in our, in here at Lincoln one year and deer will, it will keep eating them. So just the, the rest, I don't think there is a, a rabbits they might munch the little flowers, but they don't eat too much. Thank you. Um, Bala asks, what salad dressing would pair well with these, the native plant leaves that you mentioned? My favorite that I'm, a, I'm from El Salvador. I love lemon, I love lime, and I just add, I just mix lemon or lime with olive oil, a little salt, and if you, uh, maybe a, um, a little bit of uh, oregano or dittany, that would make a wonderful salad dressing. And it's very, it's kind of healthy, not much uh, fat, uh, it has olive oil. And it, it's probably my, my, is my simple and favorite way to eat my salads. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You can also, uh, instead of lemon or lime, you can also use uh, vinegar instead of lemon. Uh, Julia, Julia has a tip. 
You can add dandelion leaves to your cooked mustard collards and, and greens and you can't tell the difference, she says. Yeah, and okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I just keep, I'll keep trying. It's just that we ha I have really been, uh, I haven't had time, enough time to eat them all. <laughs> <laughs> Anne asks, can you talk about New Jersey tea versus prairie red root? Are both of them edible? And these are two plants that are both in the Ceanothus genus. Ceanothus americanus is New Jersey tea and Ceanothus herbaceous is prairie red root. Uh -huh. Can you talk about these two, Nadia? I know about New Jersey tea. I'm sorry, I don't know about um, red root, if it's edible. I, I assume it is, but I, I, I don't know. I will, um, I just don't know about New Jersey tea. We dry, we use the leaves for tea. But that's all. Maybe anybody in this group will know. Yeah, if anybody has any knowledge, um, please put that into the chat. Uh, question from Karen. I have a lot of slender mountain mint. You said hairy mountain mint tasted better. How much better? Should I replace or attempt to replace mine with hairy mountain mint? It's not quite as vigorous as one would suppose. Oh, um, no, I, I think you're good having either one for your pollinators. Uh, the, for food, the, it's definitely Hairy Mountain being more flavorful and more aromatic. And there are times of the year when you can use Slender Mountain Mint, but it, we haven't figured it out when. Uh, but, but it can be uh, aromatic too. But um, having both, I think, have both. And then you will enjoy the pollinators and then you can eat more the hairy mountain mint. And, and we do have that at Lincoln, if anybody wants to come sometime and see the demonstrations of those plants, any of these plants. I will add personally, the, the hairy mountain mint is markedly pungent. I mean, it is very, very uh, fragrant. And I uh, Nadi has made um, mountain mint ice cream, which was to die for with the hairy mountain mint, didn't you, Nadia, with the hairy mountain mint? Yes, we, yeah, we use it one year and also uh, the, the tea. You have to be careful because if you put too much, it can be bitter. So yeah, I, I do prefer hairy mountain mint for cooking, for teas, for, for uh, desserts, but you have to know the, the amount uh, to use. It might be too strong for some people. There's several questions about amending soil. Would you recommend or need to amend soil or add fertilizers for any of the plants that you have mentioned? No, oh, actually I do like a uh, white leeks. Is that one is an, is a naturally grows in, in sites that are moist with a lot of organic um, matter and they grow well in the stands of um, oak, oak trees. So um, that would be the one that I would recommend to grow in with um, good quality, good nutritious soil. But the rest of the plants, I don't, I have never had any problem growing them in, in poor soils. And that's the point that we make here at Link and we try to grow these plants. So, so you don't need to add too much. We do use compost when they're first established but later on, we don't. We don't need to add additional amendments. Thank you. A question, are the native sages good for cooking? That's another uh, one kind. We have, we have tried blue sage, just the flowers. Uh, we used to match one time. You can, you can use them. They are edible, but you have to be careful because they're very strong. They can be, if you use too much of the, of the flowers, it can be very uh, bitter. Uh, Becky has a tip about uh, leek seeds. Leek seed needs to go onto the ground in September, October, right after it falls off the plant. If you wait a year, it will take another year to germinate, if at all. Yes, leeks would grow better in compost amended soil, she recommends. Thank you. Um, when you're when you're making tea, how long do you suggest steeping in general? It depends on your plan. For example, here in Mountain Maine, depending on how concentrate you want it. If you want to use it immediately, 
it only takes a couple, even one hour sometimes. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there, there are like, let's see. I mentioned one that we, let's see now, I, I have to remember what I had. But some of the, it depends on like the means, they don't need to have, the, they don't need to be steep for too long. Others can be, they're mild, depending on the, how, how strong the leaves are. Um, so it just varies depending on the species. Let me see if I remember, now I forgot, but the means are the ones that I, I would be careful about to steep them for too long. Thank you. Um, there are several questions about how to identify uh, these plants. And for most of the native plants that Nadia mentioned, uh, we have photos and information about them in the native plant na database on the Grow Native website. And we will send a link uh, to that uh, in the uh, email that Brooke will send to everybody tomorrow along with a link to this recorded webinar. Also, we will include the uh, names of the uh, publications that Nadia uh, sh showed on a previous slide. And there was a question, Nadia, of those books that you showed, um, if you're just starting out, which, which book would you suggest? I would suggest the, this one. Oh, uh, this. The Wild Edibles of Missouri? Yes, because this is a this is very basic and is is very local, and it has also native it has natives and non natives, and it has good in illustrations. It's available in in the website of the Missouri Department of Conservation Conservation website. It's out of print, but you can download it. And there are uh, others, as I say, it's very hard to recommend any particular book because they all have some plants and the others, they all have, others have some. This is the latest, Oops. it's the latest, the forage. Can you see it now? Oh, it's backwards. It's the foraging the Ozarks. It's one that, that it, it's just out of print and it's very, um, so it is a lot of, it has a lot of plants that we have in our areas. There are some missing, but maybe with the other one, you will complement uh, your sources. Thank you. A uh, question about, are any of the recipes that you've shown, are they available anywhere? I'm working on it. Uh, I took a break from, from my native plants throw it and for three years and now I'm back. So we are working on making um, a list of native uh, uh, recipes. I did a write, um, we're working on fact sheets. So if anybody wants a, an, any particular recipe that they saw in the, in the webinar, they can send me an email and I'll send them to them. But right now we don't have them available for uh, online yet. Thank you. I'll also add that we do have a native edibles page on the Grow Native website and we do have several of Nadia's recipes there. And, um, and we're going to ask Nadia for more recipes too. So. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Thank you, Nadia. A question, what is the large leaved plant in the background behind you, Nadia? Oh, it's actually, let's see, let me, let me, you can see it better. Some of you might recognize it. It's actually a dark potato or arrowhead plant. It's a wetland plant that grows in ponds. And we did try it. I mentioned that we are actually evaluating tubers and this plant will produce uh, some tubers at the end of the year. They were very productive. We did a, our, um, last year we did a preliminary study. We grew them in tubs. And that is something that we're gonna do again. This time formal, we'll do some research and hopefully we can develop some recipes for people to try. Wonderful. Uh, question, are you planning another Dining Wild experience this year? I'm waiting for the, for, um, the blessing from 
Lincoln, but it might be until next year. We do want, we are planning to do some, uh, maybe smaller, much smaller than before because the situation with the, with the pandemic, but we do plan, <clears throat> I will, um, I don't know the days, but the plan is to have one, even if it's small. And they can check the, the webs, uh, the native plants are more Facebook page and we'll share it with Grow Native when we, when we are ready. Thank you. Um, where can you get duck potato? That potato again from I uh, Missouri Wildflowers Nursery is what I got him. I got ours. Thank you. And uh, and I'm sorry. I, I just want to mention an additional one. We have Becky here. She has she uh, grows wetland plants, so she might be a good source for for people in the in our area. Thank you, and we'll we'll include that in the email tomorrow. Um, are undergraduate and graduate students working with you? We have one graduate student. He's actually from Jamaica. He's one of the best students I ever had in uh, ever. And we are gonna work with more uh, with students and we'll, um, we hope to have some internships later in the year. And I just became full time last December. So I'm still working on my plan of work and that's the plan to have more students involved, help us with the gardens, and not only students, anyone in the communities that would like to come and see what we have. We always have a room for volunteers and they will live with some of the plants that we grow or even some of the, um, even some of the native edibles. So, but the, the plan is yes, to include, um, to include them in the future. Great. And uh, we're coming up on five o'clock, but Nadia said she can stay for a bit longer. Um, there are still some other questions and we still have 246 people with us. So um, Camilla asks or mentions, you mentioned chickweed in a photo. What's your favorite way to eat chickweed? I like it raw. It was my favorite salad dressing that I mentioned and I mix it with solar greens, but I also try, had it in, I had it in the, uh, my eggs in the morning. Very refreshing. One uh, word of caution, you have so much chickweed that you start, you get so excited if how I do. Uh, and then I, uh, my husband started complaining because it was not again, <laughs> but if you like it and if you have plenty, save it and, and freeze it and, and then you can have for later in the year. So there are different ways. It can be raw, eaten raw or cooked. Thank you. And a couple of people are asking about the desserts webinar. When is it scheduled for? And I don't know that we have scheduled it yet, Nadia, but we would love to schedule that with you for later this spring. Uh, if your schedule allows, and we will certainly let everybody know through our e-news and on our website and uh, social media. Yes, yes, we haven't decided yet. And again, they can check the My Native Plants Are More um, event page. And we are planning to have um, events here at Lincoln. And even, um, I just, I just, I'm just waiting, maybe give it another month and then we'll, we'll know uh, for sure what is that we'll be offering for the public. Thank you. And, and we'll provide a link to Nadia's Facebook page as well. Um, there's some questions here about um, plantain leaves. So English plantain is non-native, but it's so common. You can find it in a lot of your yards and uh, vacant lots and you know coming up through the gravel of your driveway and so forth. Um, have you used those leaves, Nadia? I have. I have cooked with them and they are, I just find them um, flavorful and like any other green, like if I, I would mix it with any of these greens that I mentioned, they non the the uh, introduce ones. And I just, but I haven't really done too many recipes with them. I do, I have tried them. Thank you. Uh, is it difficult to grow lead plant? No. Well, if you buy, um, you can grow from seed and, and do your, your regular stratification um, 
uh, methods that you have to go this uh, after propagating, after uh, allowing the seed to be for six uh, weeks in cold, cold and moist conditions, you can have the germination. Um, but you can find it in native plant nurseries too, and that would be much easier. But um, we have done it and they grow, they are viable. The seed is pretty viable. Thank you. Will it hurt violets to take the flowers? No, really. When I show you, I mean, I don't go, I wouldn't do it if I just had a little patch of flowers. But you saw, if you saw the, the backyard, we have not only, I only show you the, that piece of, la, of area where we have the white flower, the white violets, but the, pur, the uh, purple violets, they grow uh, in almost every pot that I have and I let them uh, grow on purpose. So I always have a source and I always see there's always a, a bee or other insects visiting others. But it's, um, of course, you, you can do it if you have plenty. Thank you. A question about, um, uh, so the, the cup plant you talked about is in the genus Sylphium. And Kathy asks, are other species in the Sylphium genus edible? It's the same as Rudek, yes. They, we haven't found any other. The other leaves are so hard, they so can be used as, as scarring pads. But this one is so soft. And it's also, they happen, these two species, Rudecia laciniata and Sylphium perfoliatum, they uh, really do well in, in woodland conditions, in shade. So, and then that allows the leaves to stay uh, more tender. But no, I haven't, I haven't tried the others. They are, and I haven't found any sources that tells me, tell me to eat them yet. Thank you. Um, there were a couple questions about, are there issues with insects for any of these plants? In other words, are there insects that might um, uh, damage? Negative, yeah, damage or negatively impact them? I, there, I have never seen that. For me, insects are first, to tell you the truth. Pollinators are first. If they are feeding on a plant that I want to eat, I would let them eat it. Like nettles, I mentioned that they are, um, that the leaves are good for these three species of butterflies and more. And when I find the, the, the caterpillars, I leave them alone. But, um, and I have never seen the plants, I mean, even if they, they, you have the butterflies or the, the caterpillars or any other insect eating them, they survive. They are so resilient. So I think we can we can uh, share with insects our native plants. Yes, and again, another reason for growing these yourselves. Um, and uh, of course, if you are, uh, if you do uh, gather uh, plant parts uh, on private property, always ask permission first, and be very careful not to uh, you know impact the, the the whole population. You always want to. Um, you know, leave plenty there, but it's even better if you can grow these yourself. Yeah, um, yeah, and like with onions, we have so many that we don't feel too bad to gather some of the flowers, and the all, all we have is the bees feeding on the flowers, and they would, would never find an insect that is eating the leaves because they are so, I guess, they are, they, it's what we are actually using them for uh, as ground covers, or with we are using them as companion plants with uh, other with vegetables that are readily um, eaten by insects. So we actually have one uh, trial to see what the on if the onions deter insects from eating the others. Um, a couple other questions about. Um... So a, a number of the plants that you spoke of, um, how long would they keep fresh? So for, for example, if you picked some, and, you know, like in your refrigerator, how long would they keep fresh? Cup plants? Or, 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 it, it, any of them, yeah, that you mentioned. 
Yeah, actually, um, yeah, I was gonna say the white leaves are the ones that get wilted very fast because their their leaves are very thin. So I would put them in um in in the leaves. So I put them in in um Ziploc bag or in a container in a um, <clears throat> in a container cover container in the refrigerator to keep them a little longer. But things like cut plant, um, um, golden glow. The onions, they last in nettles. They last a while, but you have to put them in refrigeration. Refrigeration, of course. Thank you. And again, um, then you can always dehydrate. Um, and again, did you say that? Do you do anything? Do you put oil on on them at all before, or you just dehydrate them straight? No, I do. I just do. I dehydrate them. I'm, I'm sure that there are. That you can try that. But it's kind of gets messy if you do that. They don't dry well if you put oil. Uh, so in that case, I better blind. I prefer to blanch them and put the oil and freeze them like that. Mm -hmm. But no, uh, for I have never tried to dehydrate plants with oil. And do you you don't blanch before you dehydrate? Uh, no, no, just no, before no. you. But you blanch before you freeze. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, questions about dead nettle and henbit. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you eat them and identify them? Same way. Uh, we can put the picture. It's not that far from the last one. If you can see, <clears throat> it's just uh, the only way that, I mean, I can explain it to you, but the best way is just look at how they're, uh, they're uh, similar. But if you see this, the hemp, it, has, it almost looked like a pagoda plant. And then from there, you can see the, you will see, this one is not blooming, but I will show you one. It's right here at the bottom of the dead nettle. If you, if you see the, how different they are. The, in hemp, you can see the, the flowers are more prominent than in a dead nettle. Could you put your cursor on that henbit flower can you, can at the you very see? bottom? Oops. Here? Yes, there it is. Yeah. So they're in the same genus, similar flower, similar flower structure, but yeah, rounded leaves with the henbit and the pointy with the dead nettle and um, both very common uh, in our yards and so forth. And do be fine if either one is fine, it's edible. And then you, the way you cook them is just so, like if you see, I would leave the, I would allow the hembit on the left to grow a little taller and then I cut the, the, the whole plant, but not without the root. And the, and the dead nettle to the right is, is, is ready to be cut. Even this one probably grew a little too tall. It's already getting stringy. Um, so, and that's what, what we do is that we treat, we keep pruning, we keep harvesting, and then you can get new growth to a point. They eventually disappear before, when it gets too hot, they disappear. And uh, one thing about these plants is that um, they can go in any recipe calling for, for uh, spinach. I rather eat them a slightly cook, either saute or a blanch, a boil very for a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, and just a couple more questions. Um, what about plants in the carrot family, like native plants in the carrot family? Are they edible or even are non-native ones like Queen Anne's lace, are they edible? To tell you the truth that I have never tried one, maybe it's one of my next plans to try this year. And, but I, I really don't know a, a golden Alexander, any of the golden Alexanders will be a, a edible, but we have a, um, a native parsley that I need to check on that, but I, I don't have a, an answer for that yet. Um, uh, Becky mentioned she that the Queen Anne's lace uh, is edible, and she also mentioned that the hen bit is blooming now, whereas the dead nettle blooms just a little bit later. Um, let's see, 
uh, boy, there's so many questions. Um, one other question, how long can golden glow and cup plant leaves be harvested before they become unpalatable? Usually, um, it probably would take uh, like three, four weeks, not much longer. Is when you start seeing that the, the inflorescence is forming in the center, is then it's probably the, the, the leaves are getting a little stringy. But uh, I mentioned that, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but um, golden glow can be eaten also in the fall. And that is um, after like, so you actually just harvest basil leaves. You just have to try and see, depending if they're growing in very deep shade, your basil leaves might be, still be very soft. But once the inflorescence is growing in the spring, is probably a, a good time to stop. I have had them even where they have flowers, but it's, it's just a trial and error with these plants, to tell you the truth. That's right. Well, um, I'm afraid that's all the time we have now. Um, thanks everyone for participating. Um, and just a final notes, um, it, there are plants that can look similar to uh, the plants we've mentioned today. Never eat anything unless you know absolutely sure what it is. Uh, for example, there's uh, poison hemlock is in the carrot family and you would not want to uh, uh, make a mistake with that. So um, this is all for general information. Um, do remember if you do any harvesting on private land that it needs to be done sustainably and with permission from the landowner. Do check the Grow Native Resource Guide for sources of seeds and plants uh, of the native edibles that uh, Nadi has mentioned. And uh, we will send an email tomorrow with uh, many of the resources that were mentioned. And we will definitely be, be planning more programming with Nadia and Nadia, thank you very, very much for your time and expertise in sharing your knowledge uh, with us this afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. Goodbye, everyone. Everybody. Bye.